country. Good afternoon. I'm Garland Wood, Master Carpenter with uh, Colonial Williamsburg's Historic Trades. And we're talking to you now from the Carpenter's Yard, right here on Bodice Tot, right on the corner of Nicholson and Bodice Tot. Well, listen to the background, it even sounds like Colonial Williamsburg, doesn't it? Now the project that we're excited about right now, is we're building a new brickyard. We're shifting the brickyard operation to be up right next to where the carpenter's yard is. And as carpenters, it's gonna be our responsibility to make the materials, and put the buildings up. We're really excited about the idea of joining these two operations together. So the building trades will be, will be uh, kind of joined at the hip, as it were. Um, and we're hoping to uh, open up operations at the new site next summer. But between now and then, we have a lot of stuff to do from the, from the woodworking end. Um, there's going to be several people that are going to be engaging with you during this uh, program. We're going to be talking about a lot of different subjects. If you've got questions that you're just, you're just dying to ask, please fire them off to us throughout the program, uh, and we will answer them as we can. And there will also be time at the end uh, to ask more questions. So we love interacting with you guys. Can't wait to hear what you've got to say. So why don't we, uh, let's take a little bit of a look at what the, the, the brick making operation is going to be looking like and all about. Hey everyone, my name is Josh Grammel. I'm in charge of the masonry trades here at Colonial Williamsburg. And that includes brick making, brick laying, plastering, lime burning, ugh, all sorts of stuff. Right now we, uh, we don't actually have an operating brickyard and that's because the, uh, the brickyard is moving into the field behind me here. Um, right now where we are is the, uh, uh, the junction of Botetot and Nicholson Streets uh, where the, the carpenter's yard is set up. We'll be basically joining the carpenter's yard, uh, creating one uh, big building trades yard, uh, as it were. So if you take a, take a gander behind me here, um, along the, the tree line back there, that's where our two drying sheds are going to be. That's where the, uh, the bricks will be uh, placed after they've dried in the sun for a little while. We've chosen this spot, one of the reasons we've chosen this spot anyway, is because of how much sun it gets. So the middle of this field here gets uh, almost uh, um, uh, full sun for most of the day, and that's going to allow our bricks, which are just made out of wet clay, to, uh, to, to dry in just a couple of days. Once they're dry, then they will go into those sheds that I mentioned that will be uh, uh, along the, uh, the, the back there, um, back tree line. Where I am standing right now is more or less where our uh, molding shed is going to be. That's where the bricks are actually going to get made. That's where the treading pit's gonna be. A lot of you might remember uh, in, the, uh, in the old brickyard walking through the clay. That's where that stuff's gonna happen. Um, so, uh, so relatively close to where the, the carpenters are. Uh, and then our, uh, our kiln, which is uh, built out of the dried bricks that we make every, uh, every summer. Um, it, uh, it doesn't exist yet and it won't exist until, uh, until fall when we, uh, when we build the kiln. Uh, we'll hopefully, if everything goes according to plan, uh, be located uh, closer to uh, to Botetot Street there, uh, kind of uh, kind of where those uh, those two oaks behind me are. The reason we're moving the brickyard, we get that uh, that question a lot, is uh, the the current spot that a lot of folks remember, uh, which is down the hill from the cabinet maker's shop on uh, Nicholson Street. It's just not a good location for uh, for a brickyard. There's uh, a problem with it flooding. It is uh, it is downhill, and as we all know, water runs downhill and uh, fills up that, uh, that brickyard pretty quickly with, uh, uh, with rainwater in the summertime. That's no good for us. But also because it is down that little path there, uh, folks with mobility issues have trouble getting to us. Uh, we're kind of hidden away sometimes from, uh, from the rest of town. So, uh, so we've been told by, uh, by guests sometimes that they uh, completely miss the brickyard on their visit. That breaks my heart. Also, if you think about uh, getting bricks out of that, uh, that brickyard, uh, going up that, uh, that narrow little path with, uh, with a, uh, a, f a forklift or a, or a dump truck or something like that is just a real pain in the neck. So being up here, um, you know, joining the, uh, the, the carpenters up here in town, that's going to make a lot more sense. It's going to be easier to get materials in and out. It's, uh, it's going to make it uh, a lot easier for folks to find us. And uh, when you think about an, uh, an 18th century brickyard, typically what they're, uh, what they're doing is setting up on the job site where the clay is available digging up the clay right there, we have to have our clay brought in. So that's an extra headache for us. Uh, so we, uh, we need to be able to, uh, to, to bring that in relatively easily. 
And so that's, uh, those are the reasons we're, uh, we're moving this, uh, this brickyard. And hopefully by, uh, by next year in 2022, uh, the brickyard will be up and running and you'll be able to, to visit us once again. Otherwise, if you're looking for the brickmakers, we're hanging out here at the carpenter's yard. Sometimes we're doing restoration work or repair work uh, up in town. So, uh, so be sure to ask around and see if you can find us. We're always happy to talk to folks. Oh boy, wasn't that exciting and interesting. That guy gets better looking every time I see him. Anyhow, so if you're looking for the, uh, the brick makers uh, in the next couple of months, well, we don't have a brickyard, right? Um, come find us uh, doing some restoration work, some repair work all over town. We'll probably be out of costume, but still happy to talk to you. And, uh, and also, while you're walking around town, be sure to look uh, for the Archaeologists, wherever they're digging, have an operating brickyard, and that's because the uh, the brickyard is moving into the field behind putting me in new here. foundations. Um, right now, where we are is the projects that are going to be coming up in the next couple of years. Um, now most of our, our buildings uh, in the new brickyard are going to be entirely built out of wood. Kind of ironic, no brick. So, uh, so how do these uh, these carpenters turn this stuff into uh, actual uh, you know uh, lumber that they can use? Well, the first step is uh, is usually hewing. So, uh, so let's uh, let's learn a little bit about uh, hewing wood here in the carpenter's yard. Well, hello, my name's Garland Wood. I'm master carpenter at Colonial Williamsburg. Uh, we're talking about material production, material preparation. And hewing is the process of taking axes, taking round trees down to square timber. And it's valuable, valuable for a couple of reasons. Number one, we don't want the whole tree. We don't even want the whole log. We want the square timber that's within the tree. So part of a part of a, a square or a hewer's job is lining out the timber, finding that perfect eight by eight or ten by twelve or whatever it is that you want, snapping lines on that log and hewing it in the forest. That's the key. It's very hard for us to move a log traditionally. It's easier for us to move a timber. And often you don't need just one timber, you need a wagon load of timbers. So the easiest place to, to square a tree is where the trees are. Squares were invariably African-American. Enslaved workmen are 40% of the labor force here in Virginia. Um, it's not a shock to see that so many uh, African-Americans are involved in, in, in the sawing, in the hewing, in the making of shingles and such, as well as brick making and, and other kinds of heavy work. They're also very involved in operating the, the, uh, the barges and the wagons uh, that are moving the, the materials from point A to point B. By the time of the revolution, I think you have to go a long way from Williamsburg to find good standing building timber, miles and miles and miles. We've been clearing the forest here when this was Middle Plantation, 1634. So 130 some years later, there's just not lots of good building timber around here. So we can tell by looking in the original buildings that this material has been brought in from other places. Here in Williamsburg, we have almost 90 original buildings. We can go inside the buildings and look at the timbers inside and see that they were hewn. In fact, this ax was replicated by our blacksmith shop to match the hew marks that we found on original buildings like the Peyton Randolph House or Bruton Parish Church, some of these other structures here in town. Welcome. Yeah. So you just saw a short video about hewing. So we'll go into a little bit more detail about how that process occurs here. Uh, so starting with that round tree, the first thing we want to do is to do some layout and get these, these dark lines on it down to the size that we want. So in this case, we're interested in eight by eight. So we can uh, start bringing that material down. And to do that, we're going to use a, a felling ax. So it's an ax that's, that's the same type you're going to cut a tree down with. But we want to put these a series of notches down fairly close to that line. So how to do that, using that ax, cutting up and down, right and left, making a, a vulnerable spot for that wood to actually split out. And you want to maybe space these out a little bit, somewhere around a foot. And that should make this a little bit faster to actually process the material. And all you're trying to do is make the space between the two notches vulnerable to a different split. 
right? So you get the idea here. We're coming pretty close down to that black line. Once we have it, kind of like this here, or all of these truly, we're going to now make that a little bit more vulnerable to a split in this direction, okay? So each one of these blows should be taking off a section of wood. And we're getting closer and closer down to that line. Matt, before we went live today, you were mentioning that this, this log was a little less than ideal. Can you tell us what makes a, a good log? What's, what's wrong with this one? What are some of the challenges that this particular material yeah, poses perfect. for you? Yeah, it's a, it's a great, uh, great segue there, um, specifically because where we stopped. So right here, you can see how much twist, maybe you can't, um, how much twist is within this piece of wood. It really limits the amount of space that I can position these notches apart. So a, a very heavily twisted piece of wood like this, they should be a little closer together. So if this were a, a straighter piece of pine, uh, I might make those distances a little bit further apart, maybe around 18 inches or so. But now you can see that split I started here is going fairly close to that line. So you're going to transition to this other section of notching. You can see taking a blow and going right above it, right above that. And then a little bit to its left and consistently making a straight line. That'll make this sort of pop off a little bit faster and dress the surface down. All of the effort here is to make this quick. You do not want to spend all day doing this process. Uh, so now we have it within probably about half of an inch of that line. The last step would be to switch over to a broad axe. So it's an axe specifically designed to turn this surface into this. And that's really what we want to see with this whole thing. So we still have about half an inch like we left the other sur surface. And we're going to just lean in with that broad axe just a little bit and take off a small sheet. I'm working forward and back and taking off a small little section. And if it takes a little bit of time, that's okay. You want this surface to be pretty clean. All right. Matt, as you're, as you're working away at that, we do have a couple of questions from Royan and Marilyn about snap lines and chalk lines. How, how far back in history does that go? Yeah, that's, that is truly ancient. Uh, you can see reference of that for, for early Rome uh, in the Egyptian times. So things like plumb bobs, uh, snap lines, they're, they're very, very old. Uh, really, the, the bigger advances becomes with what material you're covering that line with. So chalk or ink, uh, both are pretty commonly used here in the 18th century. But uh, ours here, this is a charcoal and, and water. Uh, you can see it leaves a, a pretty good line. It's not waterproof, which is, I'd say, one of the flaws to it. But uh, there are other alternatives too. Yeah. So uh, once you get this all squared up, it's still a massive thing that you've, you've got to move. How do you go about yeah. Moving material like this, how many people does it take to do that, and where do, where do you take it next? Sure, sure. Uh, so the moving of this material within our yard here is uh, is going to be with this green cart here, this this uh, log carry cart. And what you're going to do is is get this fully square or rectangular here. You're going to lose a lot of weight within this process, and uh, you're going to use levers and and uh, cribbing to wedge this piece of wood up. Um, but once you have a, a square, you can, you can find the center and know that that's the balancing point of this timber. All right, so if it's still a, a round tree, the trunk will be heavier, the top will be lighter. So you can't really figure out the, the true balancing point. But once it's square or rectangular, you can do that. So mark that out and then uh, lever up on one side, put a piece of cribbing under there, push down on the other side, keep going until it's about two or three feet up in the air. You can drive this vehicle right under that balancing point, bring out the cribbing, and uh, one or two people can move that timber wherever you need in, in the yard here. But mainly, if we're talking about framing like this, if it's not going to stay 
uh, a hewn timber, if we want it to be a bit smaller, it's going to go over to our saw house where we'll process it further. Um, and that's, uh, that's really where we'll, we'll take the next, next section here. Riving is an old English word that means splitting, but I think really it means splitting with control. So we rive out materials for a house like shingles. Uh, making the lumber for a drying shed for uh, the new brickyard that we're going to reconstruct uh, just behind our yard. Uh, so the building behind me is a saw house. And all it is really is a roof over top of a hole in the ground that we use a six to seven foot tall pit saw in. Uh, the way that saw operates is one person will stand on top of the piece of wood you see laying over top of the pit here. Another person will be standing below it. The person in the pit does all the cutting, pulling the saw back down. The person on top of the log will lift the saw and reset it so the person in the pit can pull the saw down through the wood. Uh, we want this saw to make long dimensional cuts. So it's not like a cross cut saw where the teeth are pointed in, in on two sides uh, or sharpened on two sides. This pit saw is sharpened and the teeth are pointed in one direction. It's only made to rip long pieces of building material out of a log. Uh, the first thing we have to do before we're using a pit saw is hew that log at least on two sides using a pair of axes to chop uh, the logs flat. Uh, basically, so the log will sit plumb on the pit. The way we will lay out the dimensional lumber we need is starting off by using a plumb bob. And all it is is a weight on a string, and it tells you straight up and down. And that's the dimension lumber that we're gonna saw, whether it's square or rectangular. Um, at this point in time, we're sawing four by sixes out of white oak uh, to make the up braces for the drying shed we're gonna construct for the brick layers. The saw, even though it looks difficult, it's a seven foot tall piece of metal and it takes two people to operate. I always tell folks the effort that it takes to swim or ride a bike is what powers that saw. And you're sharing that work between two people. It's more about endurance and rhythm in between the two people sawing than it is strength. Again, the teeth on the saw are probably upwards of an inch long sometimes. And you don't want a whole lot of strength pulling that piece of metal through the saw. Uh, what you do want is a light touch, letting the saw do the work. Like I say, rhythm and uh, familiarity in between the two people sawing, that's what makes that saw work efficiently. There aren't many water-powered sawmills east of Richmond in Virginia. Uh, just because of the fall line, the water is more tidal here. It doesn't run the same direction all day. What you do have is huge amounts of enslaved labor, huge amounts of trees, and those trees are in the way of growing crops like tobacco and corn and wheat. So as they get felled, a lot of times they're going to get processed into building materials that somebody is going to generate wealth off of. The pit saw, like I say, it's a common tool only in the sense that you're using it for processing building materials. In our endeavor to reconstruct houses here at Colonial Williamsburg, we spend a whole lot of time using the pit saw just because we can't go buy the lumber that looks like it was made in the 18th century at a modern store today. When we talk about making building materials and moving building materials, you know, hewing, you're basically going to get one thing out of a tree. You've got a pretty massive thing that has to be then moved to be processed or used in a building somewhere else. Sawing, you can, you can move the timber to a saw pit and you can saw it. Uh, I, I guess my point is it's, it's a lot easier to move the finished product um, and that brings us to the, to the subject of riving. Riving is the old English word for splitting, splitting with control. Riving is making clapboards, making plaster lath, making fence pails, fence rails, making shingles. The best place to rive stuff is right where the tree is. And that actually leads to communities of people existing in the forests and in the swamps producing this riven material, which is then loaded on wagons and barges and uh, flats and moved to the cities and towns. So let's talk about arriving a little bit. Riving is an old English word that means splitting, but I think really it means splitting with control. So we rive out materials for a house like shingles, clapboards, plaster lath. If you're serious about making shingles, you have to have people, just like we were talking about with hewing, they've got to work near the source of the trees. Uh, places like the Great Dismal Swamp, 
I think it's easy to say that a lot of the shingles on the roofs of houses here in Williamsburg were made in the Dismal Swamp miles from here and then brought by boat up to the cities to sell. There were enslaved workmen called shingle getters who lived in places like the Dismal Swamp 10 months out of every year. And their job was to fell the trees, saw the, the wood to 18 inch lengths, and then shave them down to a taper. So again, they're using a fro to split the cypress and cedar down, which is gonna give you a rough board. And that's okay for a country building or a farm building, but here in town, what they want is a very refined looking shingle. So the shingle getters are gonna use another tool called a draw knife, a shaving horse or a draw bench that clamps the wood very tightly and lets you shave it down. So why am I not making you a shingle from scratch right now? Because this material is very hard for us to find today. We have got good information about the Dismal Swamp Company uh, in the 1850s, talking about how all the, all the virgin trees have been cut. So, so from 1760 to 1850, they'd cut down all the standing cypress on the Virginia side of the line. But uh, the shingle getters worked to a quota, at least they did in the 19th century, and uh, were pretty much left to themselves. Is basically you were set to work in a swamp and nobody was looking over your shoulder. You just had to make your quota of shingles. And you know, if for nothing else, you were left alone uh, to suit for your, to, to, to shift for yourself. You were left alone in the great dismal swamp, right? <laughs> With the snakes and the bugs and, and all the other uh, horrific conditions that were, that were there. Riving is the simplest way to work up building materials. Hewing is a pretty simple way sawing a little bit more complicated, a little bit more expensive. And you can imagine, uh, you know, in a country setting, you might have very f little material in a building that was made with a pit saw uh, and a lot more split and hewed. So think about a log house with a, with a split roof. Uh, but here in the town or the city of Williamsburg, they wanted a much more refined look. You see a lot more pit sawing. So there you have it. Lots of different ways to make building materials uh, for the buildings that uh, are coming up in our immediate future. We've talked about hewing, and sawing, and riving stuff. The building we're focus focusing on now is, is gonna be one of the large drying sheds that uh, the sun-dried bricks will be stored in. Um, and we've almost got all the parts made. We've been working at it for quite a while. We rived out about 8,000 shingles, so they're piled up and ready to go. And we've hewn and sawn the posts, the plates. We've got our rafters and collars and studs. Um, we're down to about the last dozen pieces of wood that we need. Uh, tulip poplar ceiling joists that will span you know, from the front wall to the back wall of the building. Um, and then we will be involved in the thing that carpenters like to do the most, which is actually cutting and fitting and putting the buildings together. So we're looking forward to seeing this building going up uh, over the next few months and uh, helping bring the brickyard online next, next year. Again, this is gonna be, I think people are really gonna enjoy seeing what we have for them uh, at the new site. I know you've been burning with questions. This is the chance to fire some at us and uh, uh, let's, uh, Let's see if we can help you out with, with that kind of information. Thank you so much, gentlemen. So first up from Doug, I was curious, a log this size, about how long would it take to hew it? And it, he was also curious what type of wood this was. And then let's, I'll throw on to his question, does the type of wood impact the, the answer to that first question about how long it takes? That sounds like a mad question. Yeah, uh, this is a, a, a southern yellow pine. Um, it's a, a loblolly. Um, so it's, it's one of the, the many species of southern yellow pine. So it's, it's fairly easy to work through uh, as long as you don't encounter its, its many issues like, like uh, pitch pockets or heavy twist or bowing. So pine, pine tends to have some of those, those issues to it. But if you find the, a better part of the trunk of the tree, nice and straight, limb free, uh, you're going you're gonna to have a pretty easy time hewing that. This piece of wood right here, uh, it shouldn't be more than maybe an hour and a half per face. Um, so, you know, you're, you're easily able to do this in a day. 
Uh, so historically speaking, um, you might be able to do two or three, four of these a day uh, without much of an issue. Um, but uh, yeah. In, in terms of other kinds of species, um, you know, carpenters like oak, poplar, and pine. That's what we see historically in the original buildings in Williamsburg. And they all hew pretty well when they're green. And they all tend to be tall and straight and not free. We're spoiled. We get to work with really nice material when we do this kind of work. Um, there aren't any knotty pine colonial houses, right? That would be just a horrible, horrible thing. So we like beautiful, straight, clear wood. Um, so again, it's also important that we're doing that work, whether it's hewing, riving, or sawing, it's dead green, it's fresh. That's as soft as the tree is ever gonna be. And then you stack the finished product up and let it, let it season. Speaking of moving this, uh, you mentioned finding a balance point. Virginia was curious to know how you find that balance point. Yeah, uh, so when it's still round, um, it's, it's kind of tricky. Because, uh, of course, the, the bottom of the tree is a bit wider than the top of the tree. So it's not even to, to truly you know, put a, a measurement on there and say this is the middle of it. But once it's square, uh, so the, the moving of, of this timber from here to that saw house, uh, it should be as easy as putting a, a ruler on that end all the way to that end, finding the middle of it, and, and that being the balancing point, or very, very close to it. Um, so good enough to, to, of course, start with. But when it's round, it's kind of tricky. You're going to have to find that by, by putting something under it and pushing down and seeing how, how it settles. Um, but that's a good question, Virginia. Daniel is firing some Lincoln at us with, uh, you know, who said, you know, if, it, if, it's, if I spent eight hours uh, hewing something, I might then have to spend, I don't know, paraphrasing, seven hours sharpening my tools. So Daniel's curious about sharpening. How often are you doing it? About how long does it take to sharpen? Uh, these axes, both the, the felling and the broad axes, uh, don't take but maybe five minutes. And, and the reason for that is because you, you very rarely let them get dull. Um, so making sure that it's, it's sharp, and then once that, that tool loses that sharpness, um, that's the second you stop and you touch it up. So it shouldn't be uh, having to rebuild this bevel every time you're going to go and sharpen it. It should be almost a, a touch-up, a very, very quick touch-up. Uh, so doing that throughout the process almost makes that uh, not, an, not an issue. Uh, just build it into the, the time that it takes, and um, you know, tool maintenance is, is always very important. Uh, a carpenter who can't use a tool because it's too dull uh, is not doing his job. Um, and that's, that's still true today. Uh, I would just argue most tools today are designed to be replaceable, uh, whereas tools of the time period are designed to be maintained. Um, and but, le learning to sharpen oh, yeah. the tools is definitely part of the apprenticeship part of learning how to do this stuff. Yeah. Axes are soft enough you can file them. Right. So when you go out to the woods, be sure to put a file in your pocket so that you can touch up the ax right when you need it. The master that trained me always said it was really hard to carry one of those water power grindstones in your pocket. <laughs> Use a file, that's what you want to do. Virginia wanted to know if you did anything to treat the wood, if you heat treated or anything like that. Obviously that's a big part of what you're doing in a brickyard is, is heating materials, treating materials. Um, but you start with this log that's really wet. Is there any seasoning or any Let treating that's done that. at any, any point in this process? Well, what, uh, excellent question. We're, we're approaching it a little bit differently. We're using different species of woods for different jobs. So where, whereas today you can chemically treat materials to make them more durable or less fireproof, less able to be burned, uh, you know, in the 18th century, we're looking for durable materials like cypress and cedar for shingles. So we're deliberately picking those over loblolly pine for shingles. We're using locust for posts because it's so rot resistant. So not only do I have to understand woodworking, but you need to know the woods and you need to know the kinds of wood that grows in the woods to use for different jobs, if that makes sense. We have soft pine, we had hard pine, we have old growth, we have new growth. There's a lot to understanding uh, the different qualities of woods, and we're selecting the woods, the species, accordingly for our needs. So, LS, Babs, and some others, questions about all the waste that you generate. What's done with shavings or even, you know, shorter scraps of, of log and, and so forth? Um, they're doing this in the woods. 
They're leaving the chips, the branches, the tops, the stumps, all that stuff is just out in the woods. All they're trying to get is a finished product, whether it's a board or whether it's an eight by eight, and they were just leaving the stuff uh, in the forest. Uh, by the time period we're talking about, the forest they're cutting these trees in might be 60 or 70 miles from Williamsburg. So nobody could figure out any profit in hauling the chips all the way to the capital city for whatever reason. That's not a very, I think today in the modern world, we'd want to use every bit of that tree, and we do. But in the 18th century, I don't think it was a big concern. The chips just molder away, return to the forest, and uh, they never gave it a second thought. To, to bounce on that as well, um, in the process of, of making things like uh, a timber like this, the stock that we're removing is generally the sapwood. So it's the outside edge of the tree, which is very prone to rot. Um, so if we can remove that uh, from, from this timber, then you're going to also end up with the, the core of the tree, the heart of the tree, generating better building materials. Uh, so though it is, it is wasteful in, in that sense that you're, you're leaving wood on the ground, um, the product that you're generating from it is better. Uh, it's going to last longer. Um, so we're, we're always doing this layout to make sure that we're trying to, to remove as much of that, that prone to rot material, that sapwood, as possible uh, to get, get something that's going to last longer as well. And, and they, they understood that, understanding that some stuff rots, some stuff is less likely to, uh, and, and utilizing the better material. Um, but yeah, it is definitely something we care about. Uh, I would say from a modern perspective in 2021, as a brick maker, wood is just fuel to me. This, is, <laughs> this might look like something nice to Matt, but oh man, I want to throw this in a kiln uh, and burn bricks. <laughs> Uh, so right before uh, before a kiln firing here at Colonial Williamsburg, usually the brickmakers were going to operating every, uh, brickyard, and that's because the uh, the brickyard is moving the, uh, into the, the, the field behind me uh, here. Um, right now, where we are is the uh, turned into something better, quite honestly. Um, so uh, so stuff like this uh, stuff we've got stacked over here, that's going in the kiln, and uh, and it is getting used, and uh, um, it uh, means it's kind of kind of less firewood we have to to go get ourselves, which uh, which is fantastic. But that's a very modern use. So today in the, in the building trades, we, we essentially have carpenters and, and the masonry trades. Um, what you showed today is, is, is this all expected to be the work of, of one person, or, or, or is it several different people? I know the carpenters today hew and rive and frame, and our brickmakers make bricks, but you also do masonry work. How many different trades are really there? How often is it one person that's sort of the jack of all trades? What is talk about the masonry side? Yeah, sure, sure. Here in town um, during the, uh, the 18th century, late 18th century, we have a fellow named Humphrey Harwood, and, uh, and he's um, a bricklayer by trade. He uh, apprenticed as a bricklayer, but he's also in charge seemingly of making bricks. He's burning lime. He's doing plastering. Uh, we've got his, uh, his business uh, records, and uh, it shows that, uh, that he's got his, uh, his uh, fingers in every one of those, uh, those masonry trade pies. And we're doing the same here at Colonial Williamsburg. We, we represent four trades as the masonry trades. So uh, we, we make the bricks, we lay the bricks, uh, we burn the lime to eventually make the mortar, um, and, uh, and then we do the plastering as well, because uh, usually plaster and mortar are the same thing. Um, so, uh, so all of that is, uh, is sort of intertwined. And even if you look at the um, uh, business records of a guy like Humphrey Harwood, He's also being paid, or sometimes it's his apprentices or his enslaved uh, workers, who are also being paid for some light woodworking. They're not taking the place of actual trained carpenters, but they're doing some of the woodworking. And now I'm getting a, a look from Matt, quite honestly. <laughs> um, but, uh, but that doesn't happen here at Colonial Williamsburg. I leave wood <laughs> stuff to these guys. Uh, you, won't, uh, you won't find me uh, doing, doing too much woodworking on my own, because it's not good. Building it. You know, a house is kind of a complicated thing. Uh, building it is the work of many, many hands. And uh, the, the period approach was to divide the work up amongst, generally speaking, the people who are making building materials and the people who are putting the building materials together. Sometimes we talk about them as the unskilled versus the skilled trades. Now, all of those trades take skill, but, you know, you apprentice to be a carpenter and a joiner. Uh, but you join a crew of shingle getters and just learn from those guys. There's no formal apprenticeship. So uh, another way to think about it is as you get into the, the felling, squaring, riving, and sawing of lumber in Tidewater, Virginia, that's almost entirely enslaved labor. So it's African-American work. 
And you know, we kind of talked about the the shingle getters living year uh, ten months out of every year in the swamps, and and then then you have people who are kind of in the middle who are in the lumber business. You know, if you're you're going to be making money by buying materials from various places along the James River, and then you're retailing or wholesaling them to to builders. If I'm a carpenter, I got to get your house built at the price we agreed on by the deadline. So, uh, an 18th century carpenter or bricklayer or joiner in Williamsburg doesn't have time to find the pine tree, saw it up, and wait a year for it to dry, right? We gotta have dry materials in our hands. Uh, we've gotta have shingles in our hands so we can, we can proceed with getting the house built in a reasonable time. And, and obviously, everything we do today in construction is based on earlier systems. So you can see that same idea in modern construction. You know, if somebody builds a house today, he doesn't know the name of the guy who cut the tree down, and he doesn't care. That's the way it works in cities. I also want to point out that, remember, Virginia is mostly rural. So as you get back into the countryside, as you push into the back country, the infrastructure and the support for construction kind of starts to fall apart. And at some point, it's just you and your family building a little, a little house to live in somewhere on the frontier. And, and you've got to make every stick of it. So remember, there's both sides of that uh, spectrum in the 18th century. We're here in the big city. So we do things differently than our cousins do on the other side of the Allegheny Mountains. So in your sophisticated big city world, yes. uh, Ellis is curious about apprenticeship. I mean, what, what, what's that length of time usually like? And you can speak to, to all of these trades. Apprenticeship runs from your kind of middle teenage years here in Virginia until your 21st birthday. Uh, uh, white and black boys and girls were apprenticed to certain kinds of trades. Um, uh, it's very formalized in Britain. It's le less formalized here, but basically the bottom line is, you, you know, the apprentice is going to serve the master um, in the same way that an indentured servant does. And as a reward for his service, his working for the master without wages for years, the master's gonna teach him the trade uh, and provide for him his education. So if you walk to any shop here in Williamsburg in the 18th century, you're gonna find some young people in there. Um, you know, if they're 14 or 15, they're, they're really just starting out and they don't know much. And if they're 20, they're probably very skilled and really tired of taking orders from the old man. And they can't wait to be 21, to be out on their own um, to earn some money. Uh, if that person is enslaved, of course, that means their master is gonna be taking the wages that they earn. So it gets kind of complicated if you think about the work environment in, in that sense. So our apprenticeship today, Matt's an apprentice, um, our apprenticeship today is similar to the 18th century one, only in that he's working on a crew, learning from the other guys as part of a team, and at the end of five or six years of training, you know, he will be a journeyman. Right. Yeah, and with uh, bricklaying, there's a, uh... Um, you know, something that, that Garland touched on there, um, especially with this Humphrey Harwood guy. I go back to him just because we have a lot of really good uh, information on him as a bricklayer here in 18th century Virginia. And uh, from, uh, from his records, it's apparent that he has a, uh, an apprentice who eventually becomes a journeyman, a guy named uh, um, uh, Watkin Hubbard uh, is with him. And uh, when, uh, uh, when he becomes a journeyman, he works alongside uh, Humphrey Harwood quite a bit but there are two enslaved individuals in Harwood's records time and time again. Uh, their names are Nat and Jerry. They, we don't have any evidence of them serving a legally binding apprenticeship. Um, so Humphrey Harwood owns their body, owns their labor, and sends them out to work on, uh, on projects. And um, they, um, they go out and earn money for Humphrey Harwood. He, uh, he charges his clients a lot of money when, uh, when Nat and Jerry come out to fix something for you. In fact, Nat and Jerry are making more than Humphrey Harwood's own son, who also apprenticed with Humphrey Harwood, um, because their, uh, their work was apparently that good. Um, so uh, so that's, a, that's another wrinkle here, is that we don't always have um, you know, uh, an apprentice who has served an apprenticeship. We've got a lot of enslaved laborers who have served the equivalent of an apprenticeship in terms of, of the work that they're doing and the time they've spent, but they don't own any of that labor that they do at the end of it, the way a journeyman does. This discussion of records uh, leads nicely into Susie's question. She's asking if, if there are good records from the period of what all this stuff will cost, what, what the cost of building materials. And then 
tack on, is, is, it a, is it volatile like it's been the last year for us here in the 21st <laughs> century, or, or do, they, do, do prices stay fairly stable? One of the challenges with building in Williamsburg is every year in the 18th century, the forest got a little bit further away from the capital city. So there's, there's the cost of the materials and then there's the cost of moving it, uh, up, generally speaking, up and down the rivers. I mean, back in our day when they said shipping, they, they really meant shipping. Um, so uh, the, the, the biggest challenges are that you're going to see in terms of the prices of things is going to happen during the Revolutionary War when inflation starts to creep into Virginia. Uh, the wages go through the roof. Uh, imported materials are really hard to find. Um, and and, and the, just the cost of doing business goes up. Um, so the prices seem to hold fairly steady in the you know, 1720s through the 70s, but as you get into the Revolutionary War period, everything kind of goes crazy the money becomes worthless. We've declared war on our hardware store across the sea. We can't really get the kinds of things that we need. That's a very interesting period in American history to try, try to study. And so the people that are here during the revolution are trying to figure out ways to meet those deficits. Um, and uh, promises, well, you certainly see that with the soldiers that fought in the Continental Army. They were promised their wages and given paper certificates for it. And uh, it didn't really end <laughs> real well for those guys. But you can see some of that in the records uh, of the newspapers, right? So if you're to look in at the, the, um, the library, the Colonial Williamsburg Library's website, you can uh, check out some of the, the newspapers there and, and just click on the years during the revolution and, and before. And like Garland is saying, you'll be able to compare and contrast uh, some of the, the government jobs that are being talked about um, you know, and, and, and what the costs are. Some of that's listed in those newspapers. Uh, it's kind of an interesting read. Um, but definitely, if you're looking for resources on that, that's, that's one place I would check out. Um, yeah, and for us as brickmakers, the, the price of brick remains pretty stable throughout the 18th century, even into the, uh, the revolution. And I think that's mostly because the resources for making bricks are always close at hand. It's clay and it's labor. We've got both of those things in the city no matter what. What really costs an arm and a leg is I keep going back to complaining about wood, but it's the firewood. The cost of firewood by the time of the, the revolution to burn bricks is astronomical. They're, they're getting their firewood from you know, somewhere probably closer to Richmond than they are uh, to, to here in Williamsburg. And, uh, and that's a big consideration. Do you bother building anything out of brick in Williamsburg um, right around the time that the capital is thinking about moving itself to Richmond? You probably don't. Nobody's really uh, spending a whole lot of, a lot of time or resources making bricks here. They're making bricks uh, further west because it's cheaper to eventually burn the bricks that you can make out west than it is here in town. Daniel's asking about stone foundations and stone walls. I wanted to know if you use sandstone or limestone, but we are mostly using bricks We use bricks no here. stone, so, yeah. as a matter of fact. Yeah, um, that's uh, just the way that uh, the Tidewater Virginia is set up. Uh, the nearest stone for us is uh, as close to, uh, to uh, modern Alexandria. It's up in Stafford County at uh, Quiet Creek. Um, which uh, uh, is now a city park, actually, with the, uh, the, the city of Stafford. It's actually worth, uh, worth um, uh, visiting if, uh, if you happen to live up that way. And um, uh, you'll find that, uh, that sandstone and limestone are both used extensively, but you have to be in the mountains for that. Uh, here in, uh, in Williamsburg, nobody's really building with stone. Um, stone is imported, and when it is used, the labor is also imported. So really, the only person who has uh, really any stone in their house here in Williamsburg is going to be the governor. Uh, so when the governor's palace is under construction, they, uh, they bring over um, um, Purbeck stone, and they bring over three or four stonemasons, uh, some of whom actually go back once the, once the building is built because there's no work for them here. One fella sticks around, and uh, when he passes away, uh, that's the, uh, the, the last stone cutter in this part of Williamsburg, uh, or in this part of Virginia, just because there's no work for him unless he wants to get into something else like you know, farming tobacco or something. But, but yeah, not, uh, not a whole lot of stone. Thanks. Uh, Donald's wondering about water-powered sawing. And when does that start to happen here in Virginia, or just mm. in general? Um, so this, this, it's an old chestnut. There's three things you <laughs> gotta have to make money with a water-powered sawmill. You've gotta have water power, you've gotta have a nearby forest, and you've gotta have a nearby market. Here in Williamsburg, we're at the top of the hill, right? Water's running downhill. There's no water power in Williamsburg. But even more importantly, there probably wasn't much of a forest around Williamsburg. 
by the time we we're talking about it. They'd cut it all down. So there's lots of water power and lots of forest above the fall lines. So say above the James River, beyond Richmond and such. But then how do you get it to market? You can get it to Richmond, but how do you get it below Richmond? So there's some, in the, so, so short answer is there were water power sawmills in Virginia. Uh, I found 14 within a day's ride of Williamsburg, but they're, they're in different counties. In fact, they even called them the timber counties. That implies there were some counties in Virginia where you could get good building timber. James City and York were not timber counties by this time period. So, but there was one near Surrey and the ad for selling the uh, sawmill says you could get your barge or your flat right up to the mill dam. So that means, okay, I can cut the stuff there, I can load it on the flat, I can sail it across the James River up College Creek to Williamsburg, sell it to the people here. So you're also competing against pit sawing. You saw how simple pit sawing is. There's two guys in a hole in the ground. Compare that to the overhead of developing a sawmilling complex. So at least for Virginia in the Tidewater, most of the stuff is pits on simply because the forest is far flung, the cost of setting up a saw pit are low, and slave labor was very cheap. In New England, it's very rare to find an old house with any lumber in it that's pits on. They had sawmills everywhere up there. But in New England, lumber is a huge part of their economy, so it made sense for them. So I don't want to beat that subject to death, but <laughs> We think about, every time we climb into the saw pit, we think about, man, it'd be nice to have a sawmill here in Williamsburg, but we can't historically justify it. Well, uh, speaking of historically justifying things, we have time for one last question. Come, Babs was, was curious if it was common for these two trades uh, to be located in the same spot. But then in answering that also, what are you looking forward to? Too, uh, about combining these trades, you know, what, what's the, the big advantage? What, what's the vision for this kind of going forward? Yeah, I think we we'll talk a little bit about that, but if you both want to tail along. Sure. Um, so, of course, just like in a modern day setting, you're going to find a lot of construction sites today in, in modern day life having multiple elements and working together. And you can also find them, find them sort of separated, right? You can find a, a mason today who has a uh, a very good working relationship with a framer and a Finnish carpenter and a, you know, you can just keep right going down the line. Um, but you can also find where they're, they're sort of separated and you, the client, have to arrange each one of these, these groups of people. Nothing really was different 250 years ago. So there are uh, large crews uh, working within Williamsburg that have uh, the, the, the brick uh, making and brick laying element, uh, the plastering element, uh, alongside the, the carpentry element. Um, and in particular, you might find that for, for people like um, John, uh, Jim, James Ray, um, who's, who's a little bit larger of a builder, a little earlier in, in Williamsburg's history. Um, but that's, that's sort of special. Um, so the, the one element that we don't want to forget about is that both of these trades are fairly transient. Right? So having a, a yard that's designated for carpentry and a yard that's designated for brick making, um, that's, that's very common here, but it might not be permanent here. It might be active for five or six years and then move to, to another part of the city where more development is or uh, more clay is. Uh, the mess that these guys leave after leaving a site uh, is, uh, is, is astounding. It's pretty um, amazing. <laughs> Archaeologists love digging up old brickyards. Yeah. It does get pretty messy. Uh, yeah, in fact, uh, bringing up James Ray is, uh, is, is a good way to mention um, that there is an archaeological site here in town, um, uh, very close to where Merchant Square is, if you've been to, to Colonial Williamsburg before, uh, that, uh, that represents a carpenter's yard and a, uh, and a brickmaker, you know, living side by side. And uh, David Minitry was, uh, was the uh, brickmaker operating uh, a brickyard on that site. Um, archaeologically, it shows evidence of bricks being burned there, but also stuff being, uh, being uh, framed up and cut there. Uh, so, so having those two trades together makes a lot of sense because, well, we got to put that foundation down. we got to start the, the beginnings of your, uh, your fireplace and chimney before these guys can frame anything uh, on top of that. Uh, so having us uh, here together kind of makes a whole lot of sense. And then if you remember um, what, uh, uh, what I was saying earlier just about the, uh, the location of the brickyard here at Colonial Williamsburg, the museum, it's not in a good location for us. Uh, so being up here on, uh, on flat ground is going to be a little easier for us. And when, uh, when something uh, you know, needs uh, maybe a, a saw and a hammer applied to it, we'll be right next to guys who can help us uh, you know, fix some stuff up. 
which, uh, which is really handy because otherwise everything had to go up that hill. And I'm, my knees aren't getting any younger, quite mm. honestly, folks. <laughs> oh, I, I think joining the trades together here is going to be a pretty good fit. Might, might dovetail together pretty nicely there. Uh, see, see what I did there? Yeah. I did. Um, but you know, I'm ultimately <laughs> going to leave it up to you all to decide. I hope you're going to have a chance to come and see us, um, visit the site, see the new brickyard when it's open, and uh, judge for yourself. But I, I think it's going to be, uh, I think we're going to be more than the sum of our parts. I think it's <laughs> going to be a good uh, addition to the historic area, and it's going to give leave us the ability to really construct some fabulous new uh, reconstructed buildings in the future. We're going to have everything we need here for the masonry work and the brick work. If we just convince the joiners to come up here and join us, That's right. then we'd have yeah. all the, yeah. the building trades in one, one happy family. One little empire. That's right, <laughs> an evil empire. <laughs> Watch well, out, Thank Taylor's. you, Josh and Garland and Matt and yeah. Ayanda, wherever you are, for, for sharing your knowledge and skills with us today and enduring a pretty good swing in, in, in different weathers uh, <laughs> here. Thank you all for watching along at home as well and sending in great comments and questions. This project was generously funded by a grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities. And as always, this program was made possible by the generosity of our donors. Thank you all. To learn how you can contribute to programs like this, follow the links pinned below or join us at colonialwilliamsburg.org. Before you gentlemen run for a cover, do you have any final thoughts? Uh, no, like these guys, I'm, I'm really excited about our two trades coming together. Can't wait to, to open up, hopefully next summer, and, uh, and show, uh, show you guys how, uh, how bricks are made. Maybe get uh, some of you involved one way or another, moving bricks and helping us out. Can't wait, folks. Can't wait. <laughs>